What's up, everybody? Hi, and welcome to Uncle Scott's Pancast, episode 10. <laughs> got a lot going on today. We're going to talk about carbon steel skillets, got some maintenance tips, some seasoning tips there, got a sales update from Debouye. Might talk a little bit about ketchup, got a little bit of a brand rant about Heinz ketchup. Got a couple of tricks to use for how to find thousands of original, authentic Italian recipes for free and possibly even more, if that were possible. Let's get started. Okay, let's start off with carbon steel skillets. We're getting a lot of questions lately about seasoning and maintenance. I think a lot of people got new pans for Christmas around the holidays and need a little help getting started. So we're here to help out with those today. Now, one of the things I've been asked about is when to add the protective layer of oil. As we all know, you get your seasoning dialed in, you do some cooking, you wash your pan, it's wet, you dry it, you stick it on the stove top to kind of evaporate off any remaining moisture that might be on the pan. And then everybody says to add some drops of seasoning oil. The question is, when do you do that? When do you add that seasoning oil? This is a simple thing, but it actually gives people a lot of headaches. You need to let that pan cool back down to room temperature before you add your seasoning oil. Why? Because when you heat a pan on the stovetop to evaporate moisture, you're getting the pan hot, but not hot enough to where seasoning could occur. You're not getting it hot enough to where oil would smoke. So when you add oil to a moderately hot pan, what you essentially do is create a half seasoning. You're kind of going halfway to seasoning the pan, but not all the way to where the oil smokes. So that oil can get sticky, it can get gunky. It drives people crazy because they get their seasoning dialed in, they cook, they clean, they maintain their pan, and then the next time they go to use it, they find that it's turned sticky somehow. It's because they're adding oil to a moderately hot pan, but a pan that is not hot enough to smoke or perform seasoning. The other day, my wife and I, we almost got into it, almost got in a big argument. She's really on me about cleaning up my office. She's accused me of being a pack rat. A pack rat. <laughs> Says I never throw anything away. It's kind of true. I do like to save boxes. I order all this kitchen stuff. Comes in in nice boxes. I don't like to throw a good box away. After all, you never know when you might need it again. We also make great storage areas for things like Old scraps of two by four from the garage. I might need this again someday. Now someone named Boris Summer wrote in and says, De Bouye can indeed go into the oven, by the way, 10 minutes at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Now a lot of times when I talk about De Bouye pans, particularly those mineral bees with the coated handles, I always say they can't be used in the oven. Technically they can go in the oven for 10 minutes up to 400 degrees. I don't really count that. You're not really doing much cooking there. You might be able to keep something warm in there for a few minutes, and possibly finish off a steak. But when it comes to doing any kind of actual cooking, you can't really do that with those pans in the oven. You certainly can't get them up to 450 degrees for over an hour when you want to do an oven seasoning. So they can kind of go into the oven for a couple minutes, but not really in any kind of substantive way. Parker Birdwell writes in and says, Hey Scott, do you need to do the touch-up seasoning on the stovetop after each use? No, you don't. You just need to get your pan seasoned correctly one time, cook it in a bunch, and then if something goes wrong, if something sticks, if you have any kinds of problems, if something pulls off a little seasoning, then do your maintenance seasoning. You don't have to do a full maintenance seasoning every time you cook. Joe Sanders writes in and says, I noticed that you occasionally use a metal spatula on a carbon steel pan. You have to be extra careful when using them. A follow-up to that from Justin Zamp also asks, does that mean if you scratch the pan, you have to re-season it all over again? One thing I love about carbon steel is that it's tough. You can use a metal spatula in your pan. It's not gonna hurt anything. If you were to do that in a pan with a traditional non-stick chemical coating, you could ruin it just using the wrong utensil one time. Carbon steel, under most circumstances, is borderline indestructible. So feel free to use a metal spatula, metal utensils. If I use a metal utensil and get a few small scratches, I don't worry about re-seasoning then. And from a certain point of view, carbon steel is so hard and slick, some of those scratches might actually let the seasoning adhere to the pan a little bit better the next time you do a maintenance seasoning. 
Who knows? But I always know that the seasoning on, say, a cast iron pan, for example, almost seems to soak down in there. It's a little bit more porous, it seems, a little bit rougher texture. It seems like there's something there for the seasoning to kind of grab to, whereas sometimes on carbon steel, the pans are so hard and slick, it almost seems like the seasoning rests on the surface. So maybe those scratches might actually give a place for the seasoning to adhere. Who knows? Okay, quick update from Debouillet on those Mineral B Pro pans that have been out of stock seemingly forever. They've been out of stock for about two months now. They've gone out of stock three times in the last six months or so. I'd like to think that we have a little bit to do with that around here. Who knows though? Anyway, I talked to them today. They're getting that shipment in next week. If you've been on the fence, if you've been thinking about getting one of those Mineral B Pros, when they come back in stock, they expect them to sell out very quickly. Make sure you jump on it if that's what you're looking for. Now, when they come in, I will blast out an update with an affiliate link. Look for that sometime next week. Okay, now I want to show you a trick I use to use Google to get access to thousands and thousands of new authentic Italian recipes to try without buying a new cookbook. So that's kind of nice. I'm going to quickly switch over to voiceover to illustrate how this works. Okay, so let's say we want a recipe for pasta bolognese. We go to Google and type in recipe pasta bolognese and we get over 29 million results, with the main ones coming from big sites like Food Network, Food & Wine, and even the New York Times. Now try this. Instead of recipe, use the word ricetta, R-I-C-E-T-T-A, which is the Italian word for recipe, and look at this. You get over a million more results, but importantly, they are from different sites, results in Italian from Italian websites. I'll tell you why this is important here in a second. But you don't speak Italian, you say, so what good does it do? Here's how to fix that problem. What I do is click on a few of the top results, find one with good pictures, then go back and click on Translate This Page. And boom, you get the recipe in English, and it does a pretty darn good job of translating. Now you have real deal Italian recipes from Italy, millions of them. Now why is this a big deal? Why not just use the English recipes and not worry about translating in the first place? because the recipes are different. Lots of the English recipes we get here are modified or variations on a theme from the original authentic Italian ones. Case in point, did you know that there is an official recipe for ragu bolognese sauce? It's filed with the Accademia Italiana della Cucina, Italian Cooking Academy. If you go to their site, you can learn the official bolognese recipe first then realize everyone else's recipes are variations on it, even the millions of Italian grandmothers out there. Now, I was looking at that recipe the other day, and look at this. I ran across another article on the site talking about a recipe for pasta carbonara from the New York Times. Now, contro means against, grande agitazione, there's a lot of agitation, and the ingredients don't respect the original recipe. Hmm. Just mouse on down and click on the English version, and it says about the New York Times' recipe that there is an online uproar. Italians are up in arms. The Food Growers Association called it part of counterfeit Italian food. And the Academy says they did an investigation and found that carbonara is the most falsified Italian recipe abroad. So isn't that amazing? Recipes that we think are official here in America actually causing outrage amongst cooks and chefs in Italy. So when you search for recipes, if you're looking for some new Italian recipe to try, use this trick and get recipes directly from the source. They seem a little more authentic. If you're into kind of learning that slow food, that old school way of learning some Italian cooking techniques, go directly to the source. And if nothing else, it just shows you one more way to waste time on the internet. Okay, now it's time for a little brand rant. I want to talk a little bit about Heinz Ketchup. They are not a sponsor. Probably never will be after this segment. But I was at the store the other day and something bothered me. Now, if you've ever read Jack Trout and Al Reese's books about positioning, about branding, you know that it's important for a brand to own a word in the mind of the consumer. For me, when I think about ketchup, Heinz kind of owns that word in my head. So if my wife says, stop by the store, pick up some ketchup, I'm going to pick up Heinz. It's the number one brand. I assume it's the best because it's number one. That's kind of the way the human mind works. How could it be number one if it's not the best? So then I go to the store and I see this. Heinz Organic. Organic tomatoes, organic certified. And I also see this. Heinz Simply. 
has pure cane sugar as opposed to high fructose corn syrup. So while it might seem great to have an organic ketchup or one without high fructose corn syrup that has natural sugars, that's great to have, but what does it really do? It makes me think, well, what's wrong with this one? What was wrong with this one? Why doesn't your flagship brand have the good stuff in there? If this one has better tomatoes and this one has better sweetener, what's wrong with this one? Why not? Come here. Yeah. Oh! Why not take the best stuff you have and put it in your number one brand? I don't know, it annoys me. There's nothing that Hunts or anyone else could have done to knock Heinz off the pedestal. But in my mind, now when I go to the grocery store buying ketchup, I have to stop and think about it. Maybe Heinz isn't as good as I thought it was. Who knows? Okay, I'm always happy to answer more questions about carbon steel pans and skillets. Make sure you get those in. Let me know what you think of the videos. Look somewhere on this screen for links to other videos in this Pancast series. If you haven't seen them all yet, there's a lot of other fun stuff you might enjoy checking out. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time on Uncle Scott's Pancast.